Ideally you have saturation down at this point, but we're just going to do a quick little review on it and then add our next component. Now we know that saturation is PSIG converted temperature. So when I have my pressure gauge and I hook it up to this suction line, we're going to get this PSIG, which is worthless, and convert it to a saturated temperature. What I'm going to do is draw my little pressure gauge here, hook to that line. Now that temperature is taking place all the way over to our evaporator inside. The majority of this evaporator is saturation, which means the refrigerant's boiling, the refrigerant's changing state from liquid to vapor. It's latent heat, and the definition of latent heat is a change of state without a change in temperature. So let's say that our pressure converted to a saturated temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. All of this coil is going to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit because the refrigerant's changing state, it's boiling. It's going to be the exact same temperature. Now here's what we're going to talk about next. When I get to this point, something very interesting happens. At this point, all of my liquid has turned to a vapor. It's still at 40 degrees, but because the air temperature is warmer than that 40 degrees, say the air is 78, this is 40 degrees, heat's gonna leave the air, go to the cooler refrigerant. The refrigerant's an entirely a vapor. Now the refrigerant's gonna start changing temperature without changing state, which is sensible heat. So what's gonna happen, it's gonna start changing temperature, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. This is a measurable heat. This is called superheat, superheated vapor. So at this point, anytime you talk about vapor, say a superheated vapor. So it's gonna be a superheated vapor and it's sensible. So in our refrigeration cycle, we're gonna add the words right here, at the very top of the evaporator, we're gonna add superheated vapor and that's a sensible heat, which is measurable. Sensible heat and measurable heat go hand in hand. So now that say I'm 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, I can add heat all the way back to the compressor, which is why this line is insulated. This line's insulated because we don't want to be absorbing any extra heat, but I can simply measure my superheat. So the definition of superheat, and write this down, the definition of superheat is the amount of sensible heat added to a vapor above saturation. Superheat, the amount of sensible heat added to a vapor above saturation. So here's saturation, which is latent heat. Superheat is going to add above that, and it's sensible. We can measure it. Amount of sensible heat added to a vapor above saturation. So we're going to be adding heat all the way back to the compressor. And superheat is a very important number. I want to always know that I have superheated vapor because this is a vapor pump. If I have saturation, I'm going to have some kind of liquid getting in, and we don't want liquid. So we want to make sure that we always have some kind of superheated vapor. A compressor, you never want to have anything less than five degrees of superheat to protect the compressor from any liquid. But superheat is a very important number because it tells us what's happening in the evaporator. And superheat, on top of a definition, also has a formula. The formula for superheat, and this is a word for word formula. People try to shorten this down, but I've already shortened this down for you. And we're going to put it just like this in your notes. Actual suction line blank degrees Fahrenheit or actual suction line temperature. So here's my suction line and we're going to do this a little bit later, but we're going to get a thermometer on the suction line and record that temperature. Let's say that temperature is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So we put a thermometer on the actual suction line. We can touch it. We can actually touch it. We put a thermometer on it, 55 degrees. The next part of our formula, suction minus suction saturated. And remember we've taught you before, saturated means PSIG converted temperature. So suction saturated. Suction, your blue gauge, PSIG converted to a saturated temperature with a temperature pressure chart. So suction, PSIG converted temperature, suction saturated, blank degrees Fahrenheit. So let's say I get my pressure, which I could care less about, and I convert that pressure to a saturated temperature. And you can use suction saturated, PSA converted temperature. So we're going to get this pressure, which is, means nothing to me. We're going to get the blue gauge, the suction side pressure. We're going to convert it to a saturated temperature, digitally, electronically. However, we're going to convert that to a saturated temperature. And that's what's happening inside the house. The majority of this evaporator is saturation, changing state. So let's say that number was 40 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to put over here 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The in, most of the coil is 40. 40 degrees, 40 degrees, 40 degrees, 40 degrees, 40 degrees. 
55 degree actual suction temperature, 55, minus my suction saturated of 40 degrees, equals a superheated vapor. Blink degrees Fahrenheit, and in this case, I have superheated my refrigerant 15 degrees above its saturation temperature. Saturation was 40 degrees. I've added an additional 15 degrees of measurable, sensible heat to the refrigerant. So this is our formula. If you write this down word for word, anytime you're doing superheat, you just simply plug the numbers in. Hey, what's the actual suction line? Put the number in. Suction saturated, PSID converted to temperature. You write that number in. This number minus that number is how much superheated vapor that you have. This refrigerant is superheated. Now there's tons of different refrigerants, but ultimately, regardless of any refrigerant that you use, once you convert pressure to a temperature and you do this formula, you will always have a reading that's gonna be valuable. Regardless of when the temperatures and pressures change, this number is gonna be valuable. Now we can't talk about what number is a good number yet because we still have a whole lot more to learn. It depends on our metering device and some conditions, but we will get there. So this is how to see what the system's doing. Superheat, think of it as blue. Write this formula in blue because superheat and this part is most commonly used with a low pressure, the low pressure side, the blue side, the suction side. Low temperature, low pressure, superheated vapor. So the suction line should be superheated vapor coming back. Superheat represents the evaporator coil. Superheat represents what's happening inside. So make those notes. Superheat, low pressure, it's measure represents the evaporator. Represents the evaporator inside. Very, very, very important. So it's the amount of sensible heat added to a vapor above saturation. Saturation's here, we've added superheat above that. So that's the most important part of superheat. Now let's go a little bit more to the thought process so we can really appreciate what's happening in superheat. So I'm gonna ask you a question here. Can you breathe a superheated vapor? Pause the video, think about that. So can you breathe a superheated vapor? Let's look at something. Air is made up of 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. So if we look at this on a temperature pressure chart, at zero PSI gauge, let's find out what the boiling temperature of oxygen is. Oxygen is O2. So oxygen at zero PSI gauge has a boiling temperature of minus 273 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the saturation temperature of oxygen. This room temperature right now is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the actual room temperature. So this is a little tricky. So if you have two negatives together, it becomes a plus. Let me word this a little differently so you can visualize it. Here's my zero degrees Fahrenheit point. We're at 80 degrees, that's above zero. And this oxygen is boiling at negative 273 degrees Fahrenheit. So to get from negative 273 to zero, we have to add 273 degrees of heat to get to this point. Now we're gonna add an additional 80 to get to this point. So we're simply gonna add 273 to 80. So the oxygen I'm breathing right now in this room is 353 degrees Fahrenheit, superheated above its saturation point. If we were at a room temperature of 207, negative 273 degrees Fahrenheit, oxygen would be liquid and vapor, it would literally be boiling. But above that, it was all entirely a vapor. After all that liquid oxygen is boiled away, now we're breathing that vapor, that vapor. And that vapor is at 80 degrees, 80 degree actual vapor temperature, minus a 273 degrees saturated temperature, the oxygen I'm breathing is superheated 353 degrees above its saturation. So yes, you can breathe a superheated vapor. You can only breathe the superheated vapor. If I tried breathing liquid oxygen, it would be at minus 273. It would freeze everything before it ever even got into my lungs. I would be dead. I would literally drown in oxygen. So yes, we can only breathe a superheated vapor. But let's go a little bit farther. The air is also made up of 78% nitrogen. The majority of the air that we breathe is made of nitrogen. Well, nitrogen has a boiling point of negative 320. So our room temperature is still the same. 
we're going to put in here minus 320. Wow, minus 320 is the temperature nitrogen boils. When you see the YouTube videos of people playing with liquid nitrogen, minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. It cannot change above minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit until all that liquid refrigerant's gone. But the same nitrogen you see with liquid nitrogen is the same nitrogen we're breathing in too. So we're going to use that in our little formula here. We're going to take 320 plus 80 equals 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So the nitrogen that I'm breathing right now is superheated 400 degrees above its saturation point. I'm breathing 400 degree superheated nitrogen. It's all a part of the science. Everything we do, we're all connected. So let's compare that. At zero PSIG, oxygen boils at negative 273. At Zero PSIG nitrogen boils at negative 320. R22 at zero PSIG boils at negative 48. Uh, propane boils at negative 44. 410A boils at negative 53. CO2, which is also refrigerant, boils at negative 109. So oxygen and nitrogen have a much lower boiling point than any of the refrigerants we use, which is quite interesting. So next trivia question is, what refrigerant has the absolute lowest Boiling point. Pause the video, think about it. What refrigerant? Maybe use your temperature pressure chart. All right, let's see. The refrigerant with the lowest boiling point is actually going to be helium at minus 453 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really close to absolute zero. Still a little ways away, but it's close. That's amazing. Minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit. So, do we actually use helium as a refrigerant? Yes, we do. If you look at MRI machines, these large electromagnets, which produce a massive amount of heat, so they actually use helium to cool the MRI machines. And MRI machines have become popular all around the world. And because there's a high demand for MRI machines, there's also a high demand for liquid helium. Back when I was a kid, liquid helium balloons were cheap, or actually just helium balloons, vapor only, were very cheap. You could get balloons filled all the time. You could talk with it, which you shouldn't do. All kinds of crazy stuff. But nowadays, because there's a high demand for liquid helium, the demand's gone up, the price has gone up, and you're using helium all over the world. There's even stockpiles of helium that we have. Helium is very commonly used in the universe, but on Earth, it's fairly rare. So helium is actually the refrigerant at the lowest boiling point, And you can still put any of those refrigerants in these numbers, and you can find out how superheated it is. It's very, very important. At zero PSIG, I would not want to breathe a superheated water because that would be above 212. But you got to separate yourself from it and think about the science connected to it. So next, we're going to go out to a unit and actually apply superheat to a unit.